just thought they were really impressive. Orthophytum species nova. Burl Marxy, of course, everybody knows Burl Marx and all of his work and the wonderful plants. Grigia, Chapada from Chapadensis is the name. Neat little plants growing over a big river area there. Look at the lichen. One of the things that I've learned also when I'm studying my cacti, which is where my focus is at, is looking at moisture and how it comes about and what the environment might be throughout the year. And lichens are a big teller of information. They tell you a lot about the quantities of moisture and how it comes. New Regilia bahiana, neat little plants, more normal here. Look in the middle here. Achavia? Marmelia? I'm not sure. Therefore, no name. <laughs> yeah. Orthophytum? Orthophytum. Orthophytum. Okay. I see the picture with a name, but I don't know. Yeah, I wish I could be more the expert for you today, but I'm just not with these. But but maybe I can inspire you to look further and and, and maybe get the plant or grow the plant. Some of these are really neat. Oenbergia, Leopoldi horsey. Leopold horse is one of our real, uh, in the cactus world, one of our real uh, uh, heroes. Leopold horsey found disco cactus horsey, mellow cactus horsey, and there's a whole bunch of, and his son, I've stayed with his son numerous times, and boy, they are really, and he has a nursery there. His nursery is unbelievable. And I'm going to say something, this is not meant to be prejudicial or anything, but you know how Germans, I'm German heritage, but we're generally very anal retentive, linear, organized, everything has to be just right. And that's pretty typical German. I'm not saying all Germans are that way. But when you see his nursery, it was the most perfect. Every plant was planted in perfect rows. Every plant was the same size. Unbelievable. I've never seen a nursery like it before. Him. And he had rows and rows of beds. The beds were the size of this table, but 60 feet long, of Ubelmanias, hectoniferas, <laughs> this big. Perfect. And I walked up to him. I said, Oh my gosh, do you ship? <laughs> I'm thinking, Man, I could pay for a lot of trips by buying a few of these, but he won't ship to the U.S. He ships to Europe occasionally, so we don't ever see his plants. Yes, Brian? The name uh, that you have on there, do you know where it came from? No, this is a uh, picture from... Uh, um, Dennis. Dennis. Yeah, so, so Dennis so called the Leopoldo Horse. Yeah. That's what Dennis called it, so I'm, he's far more the expert than no, I'm no, I. No, the reason why the question is I don't think I've seen one that looked quite like that. I, I know there's going to be variation in nature. It's just that I, I've never seen one that looked quite like that. All this leaves. Yeah, there's a, some yeah. of them around Southern California like this, and it comes in like many different sizes. But I think there there are different names and they have definite, definitively renamed them. I've seen them from four inches up to 20 inches, and they all have the Leopold horse I name. So. Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, I've never seen one like that. Yeah. That's why I was questioning it. We had one. Uh, and, and I wish, once again, I could be more educational for you, but I can't. No, no, it's just, I, I'm not saying that it's not, it's just I've never seen one. Yeah. So I was asking, where did the name come from? Who put the name well, from? wherever Dennis developed it from or arrived at that name, I don't know. That would be. Okay, thanks. Sorry. There is that's, another. No, that's oh. fine. That's what we want. That's what we're learning today. <laughs> Those are really hard. Eurogelia mucugensis. Interesting plant. Anybody grow that? I don't think it's in the tree. Orthophytum navioides. Navioides. Along the river there. I photographed this in numerous sites. They are stunning. That red center. This is the Chapada diamantina. 
And I was there on this particular trip looking for, once again, Ubalmanias. And lucky enough, the bromeliads are all on the rocks here along the side. The Ubalmanias are a little bit more up on the hill. But I was able to catch a nice rainbow that day. And this, right there. Wow! Look at the color. It doesn't get any more intense than that, does it? What is it? Nergelia. Nergelia what? Okay. Brigia lancifolia. Mm. Mm. Not very lancifolia. <laughs> Orthophytum sanguinium. Here's your sanguine flower or color. Mm. I like plants that can have these stripes and patterns. I think that's very attractive. Navioides again from Rio Chino in the Japana region, which is where I was taking you along the Rio. Orthophytum lemmy. That's what a beautiful sight. Would you like to have big rocks in your garden where you could have little terraces with these plants like this? You, have, you might have to throw a couple cacti in though. <laughs> Succulents too. Bilbergia, Portiana. Look at that flower, isn't that wonderful? What is it? Breezia. Is it a Breezia? Probably. Looks like it. Should be a Gabioides. <laughs> Orthophytum albo pictum. Wow. Look at that beautiful white. I mean. It's just the opposite, you know. Usually it's red in here and then green or something or gray out here. It's just the opposite. Has anyone seen that in cultivation? No. Yes. Yes? Where? In Florida. Oh, in Florida? Yeah. I, I have a question here so you can educate me a little more. Um, the differences in the plants available from Florida versus, let's say, Southern California. Is it pretty extreme? A lot, so. a lot of crossover? I used to hear that they couldn't grow Tillandsias in Florida and we couldn't grow Neos out here, which isn't true either way. And I've seen wonderful Tillandsias grown in Florida, uh, including the dry ones. And uh, they just have a different, they have summer rain, we have winter rain. Yeah. Yeah. Here's one comment. Woody, I, I found that the plants, if you get them from Florida, you're going to acclimate them kind of slowly. Yeah. yeah. Do it slowly over like a couple of years. So well, that makes total years. sense to me because yeah. the same is true with the cacti and the succulents, you know, that they come from one region or another. You acclimate over one, two, three year period. And you got to put them in a greenhouse. They adjust. And then the, 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 the offshoots and yeah. slowly them outside. The other thing, Woody, I would say is that, like Southern California, Southern Florida was one of the epicenters at the beginning of bromeliad cultivation in Mojave in the 50s and 60s. So you do have some of the primary older collections with very similar material. Mm -hmm. And then getting the newer hybrids, this and that, it's kind of a, like a private club thing there. Yeah. Here it's a little more democratic of what you can get. I've heard it's a little different crowd there yeah. for a number of reasons. It's a little more private. <laughs> Nice. No, no, nothing negative there. No, just, no, no. Nice people. Crowds. Just nice crowds. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to get to know them and pay big money. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're zeroing in. <laughs> Incalarium species nova. This is exciting. I was with Marlon Machado, who's Brazilian, on this trip. And we're going along looking in this fluted limestone material. And this is a brand new species. And Marlon said, I'm going to describe this, and I want to describe it because it looks like an aloe. And I said, I think that's good, but I've seen some agaves that look like that, too. So I said, are you sure you want, you want to go aloeides or maybe agavioides? He hasn't decided. And I'm not sure if Marlon has described this plant yet or not, but it is a stunner, and it grows with gorgeous ceroids and Oh, some other wonderful uh, disco cactus. 
uh, just a neat area. Chile, the coast of Chile. I spent a number of trips here and possibly next year I'll be leading a trip. Anybody wants to do a trip, uh, but you have to be prepared to camp out and four wheel drive it. Because we're going to do two weeks all on the coast, primarily looking at the cacti, but you'll see all the Brahms along the way and there aren't too many on the coast of Chile, but there are some. This is, by the way, Ulicnia acida. What a neat plant. Very moist area in Chile, unlike most. Anybody growing this one? Mm. I think they have it out of the Huntington. Uh, it's, it's around. It's around, here and there. I think they got it the hunting, Huntington. There are so many other Chilean plants I could show, mostly Tillandsias, because they like that aridity. But here's a Tillandsia secunda. This is Ecuador. And Bromelia melanzi. That is stunning, isn't it? Anybody growing that one? Is that pretty common? With that flower, I think everybody grow it. It's a vicious plant. Vicious. Stay away from it. Yeah, it's another one of those you see them. Although this one, you don't reach in. You might come out okay, but you probably won't get in because it'll stop you. Yeah. If you compare that slide uh, to the one you had of Amelia Sarah, you see if there's any difference. There's a huge uh, botanical debate as to how different those are. Really? Yeah. I'll That's show you an article on it. That's good information, Mike. Thank you. And no one wants to grow them or go near them for obvious reasons. Well, that's why they haven't been able to describe them well, because... <laughs> I have an article on it, I think. Here's a Pitcarnia arcuata lita from Ecuador. Now, that's one, this is a Dennis Cathcart picture. You can usually tell his that he has these sides. You have that one, Bob? Yeah. Do I? Do you have that one? No. I can't imagine anybody would want that one personally. Bob's a big cognac expert. Really? No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm a fan. He's a he's a big fan. That makes him an expert. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's probably true. But I'm not. I can't imagine being a fan of this one personally. You know? Well, what what you're not realizing, but that picture is the flower started up about I'll say eight inches above where you see the one yeah. flower. Yeah. So yeah. it's been flowering for a period for a long time. And they look a lot better in cultivation. And Chester has been hybridizing these, and he's got some unbelievable plants awesome. coming on. Awesome. They make good landscape plants. Puya Hamada, Ecuador. Once again, the Puya is all up along the coast from Chile through Bolivia, Ecuador, and stuff. These are neat plants. Once again, a little uh, dangerous. Puya species with Tillandsias. Ona Loja Ecuador. Looks like petroglyphs, but they're not. <laughs> I don't know if you're looking at these gorgeous Tillandsias in here. And this is Puya Lanata El Tablon, Ecuador. Gorgeous colored plant. This is an area that I kicked myself because there was a gentleman in the cactus hobby named Chuck Hansen who was known for years for his nursery in Tucson, a euphorbia succulent person. And he moved down to uh, either Ecuador or Colombia, it doesn't matter at this point. And he said, Woody, I'm developing a nursery on growing terrestrial orchids. And he had some plants with the most gorgeous leaf patterns you can ever imagine. Little terrestrial plants, really exciting. He said, come down and spend some weeks with me. We'll just go out in the field and we'll run around. I never did it. I'm kicking myself. He's now moved back. For those of you who know who Chuck Hansen is, he moved back to Iowa with his wife. And he then called me. I've got to tell you this story. This is kind of funny or cute in my opinion. Years ago, we would do programs. We'd be in Australia or England. or we'd, I'd do something on cactus. He'd do something on succulents. And he would always talk about why would anybody want to grow those ugly cacti? Why would anybody, you know, he'd put them down. So I'd get up and I'd go, can you imagine anybody growing these weedy succulents? So we did this, this debate back and forth. So when he moved back here about a year ago, maybe a little more now, he calls me up and goes, Woody, I'm going to start a nursery again. And I said, oh, that's great. 
I said, uh, what are you going to be growing this time? And he goes, well, that's where I, I, why I called you. <laughs> he says, I'm thinking about growing cacti. <laughs> and I said, oh my gosh, you've gone to the, the dark side. That is what happens. But now he's now moving to Tucson. And he's going to start up his nursery there and grow cacti and succulents. So, is that look, to grow uh, terrestrial or any water? water? Uh, to my knowledge, I can't tell you where he's gone with the terrestrial orchid stuff, but I suspect he's probably... That's gone? Yeah, and simply because the environment where he was was perfect where he is now, both of those are tough. Yes? When you say terrestrial orchids, are you speaking of the small lalias, the piculous lalias that grow yeah. on the rocks? Are yes. you talking about the ones that really grow in the dirt? Well. That's difficult for me to define because that's what he defined his group of plants he was growing. Okay, well, but terrestrial meaning plants effectively in the soil, the dirt, or on the rock. Although some of the plants in Brazil are they're not terrestrial, they just happen to have a rock as a perch <laughs> instead of a branch. So I think he's talking about the ones that are in the soil. Really? That's, that's what I think, but that's putting two and two together. Puya Lanada, El Pablo. See the river in the background here, a nice, uh, cute little uh, Espostoa. Papinia. Coralina. Who grows that? Nobody. A neat plant. Is it easy? Relatively. Relatively so here. Talansia secunda, vivipara, or vivipara if you want. Interesting plant. Mexico. This has been where I've spent, as Mike mentioned, I've spent since 1969, I've been traveling to Mexico two, three, four trips a year. In the last few years, I, I went to the dark side like Chuck did, and I started looking at succulents in South Africa and Madagascar, and I've returned. I'm now back. The dark side only got me for a little bit. <laughs> now I'm back to Mexico. I made a trip this last year. And, Mexico is uh, a scarier place than it used to be, and we actually got uh, stopped by what we believe were cartel people, but they left us old farts alone, you know, because we weren't worth it. Do you have but the species in your collection? Do I have this one? No. I wish it. Do you? No. No, no it's no. stunning. That's a de that's a Dennis Cathcart photo, by the way. But it's uh, it's from Wawapan, Wawapan de Leon. Oaxaca, Mexico. Some of the plants in Oaxaca, oh my gosh, you guys would kill for them. Here's a Hectia species from Oaxaca, Mexico. And I don't know, I've seen so many of these. And so many of them you see and you go back, yeah, I've seen that for 35 years, and yeah, we just describe it as a new species. <laughs> but we don't, yeah, I don't know what I'm looking at, so it's just a neat plant. Hectius in the Tehuacan wow. region, Tehuacan, which is north of Oaxaca, of course, central Mexico, we'll call it. Running through that field. And a Hectius species in the Tehuacan desert. Wow. I like the blotches of purple it puts on. It's very unique in that respect. And another Hectia from Guamelula Canyon, Oaxaca. That's been named uh, Guamalensis. Named for its location. It just was named about two years ago. Wamaluensis, Wamalu or yeah. just the way that. <laughs> so add an insis right here. Yeah. Okay. Wamaluensis. Okay. Wamaluensis. Anybody growing it? There's a couple at the Huntington that were always mislabeled as uh, Hectia glauca. Yeah, it doesn't look like glauca to me, but look at that Hectia from Chiapas. Whoa. That's pretty stunning. Have you been to Chiapas? Yes. I've done all of Mexico. I'm bragging. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I have. I've done. You name it. Mexico's been my... And I'm so happy after this last trip to be back as I thought to myself. You know, South Africa is fantastic. Madagascar's fantastic. Namibia's fantastic. But Mexico's my home. It's where my heart's at. So. There's things here that are just Jalisco. This is Versulia. 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 Yep. 
Nice little plant. Here we have a guy named Benji. Name's ringing a bell, yes. It's a Oh, really? Okay, thank you. That's good information. There were a couple of great ones of these at the San Diego show. Oh, Ursula. Ursula, Ursula, good. Uh, Andy Sickenman and Robert Kopstein had a couple of these at this year and last year's San Diego show that were just out of this world. Unbelievable, huh? Yeah. Hectia guatemalensis, all the way down to Guatemala or close. It's from Honduras. And Bromelia hemispherica. Fosterella. Mm. Oaxaca. That's a, that's a pretty flower, isn't it? It's simple, but it's beautiful. Hectia species. Thomas McDougall's one of my heroes, also did a lot of work in Oaxaca, Mexico. And this one is named, uh, or at least provisionally in his honor, Hectia McDougall. It's been changed. What's it changed to now? Rosea. Rosea? As a species name? Yep. So McDougall's name is dropped? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, Thomas is such some a people hero. might say parentheses. Okay. So Rosea had priority, probably? No, somebody got together and said it was the same species as a variety. Typical Rosea. Okay. <laughs> Area Carpus fisheratus intermedius, <laughs> crested form right between my legs there. Oh, my. I know. Close your eyes if you're embarrassed. But over here, in town, right now, you might have seen him Thursday night as my buddy Attila Capitani. And I booked him for like, I don't know, 15, 17 clubs here. He's doing a tour all through the U.S. Well, not U.S., California, Texas, Colorado and stuff. And this was when I led him and a number of people on a trip into Mexico, 1991. It's scary to think that that's, what, 24 years ago? But we stopped in Oaxaca. You see the Eusneoides hair in here. And we were gathering firewood because we camp out. Well, we gathered this old, broken down oak limbs and stuff. It was all dried out. And we were going to burn it. And on all these limbs were, were bromeliads, melanzias, and you name it. And these Australians said, you can't burn this. These have covered with bromeliads. <laughs> well, we said we're going to burn them because we need a fire tonight. But you can take the bromeliads off and put them in other trees. So they did. And here, Talanzia, the famous Talanzia man, this is a sighting that only I have had the pleasure of photographing this particular, and you can see what an exciting creature it is. Does he happen to have big feet? Uh, well, go to his next program. Let's see. Uh, he spoke last night at L.A. Club. His next talk will be South Coast this Sunday. So go see. If you haven't seen any of Attila's talks, go see him. He's a great presenter. You'll really enjoy it. He's next, doing it on Australian succulents. Instead. Next Sunday, you mean? This coming Sunday. Yeah. Tomorrow. No. No. Tomorrow. Tomorrow's the auction, right? Thursday, he's got San Diego. Tomorrow's Long Beach. Today's at the <laughs> Huntington Symposium. And... Sunday's at San Gabriel, I mean, Thursday's at San Gabriel. Yeah. And next Thursday, San Gabriel, next Tuesday, Bakersfield, but he's around. So look, you'll see a schedule published here and there. I sent it out to everybody. But anyway, that's Talila, uh, Talila, <laughs> Talilianzia. No, it's Attila Capitani. He's a great guy, and really knowledgeable, very entertaining speaker. Peru. Fleming. One of my favorite things when you come into Peru and you drive along the coastal areas are the sand dune mountains, but they're covered with bromeliads. And here, this is the one that David Cathcart called it subspecies graffiti. <laughs> and what they've done is they've planted these plants in the map to manners in which they are Joe loves, <laughs> Elaine, so-and-so for governor, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Coastal dunes, Lanzia latifolia, and Puparia. How do these plants, but they survive on fog? Lots of fog. Lots of fog. Can you imagine there are Talanzias in there? 
There are. These are pretty amazing and quite beautiful because they're so magnificently staged in this sparse landscape. In Warner Rowell's uh, original book on Talanzia, he has a picture of a valley. It's about four miles wide and it goes 40 miles deep and it's covered. Solid. These little tiny dunes all the way. It's yeah. incredible. Well, that was in the 50s or 60s. Yeah, burn around another one of my heroes. Yeah. Three Talanzia species in one spot. These are exciting plants. Neutraconia, Longitatella. Very, very pretty plants. You can see here, Valley of Peru. Look at here, we've got really different plants. Bromelia, Scarlatina, Pabos Peru. Is, is this a jungle area? This right here? Yeah. This is pretty jungly. This is the Amazonian side. But this one isn't. This is high in the Andes. We're at 12,000 feet. I don't remember. I've looked up the elevation. But this is the best, well, in my opinion, the best of the Puyas. And you see these growing high up, and they're spectacular, and you think, wow. But you really don't realize how big they are until you compare it to your wife. Yeah, 30, 40 feet. That's my wife. And she's not a midget, <laughs> normal. So you can see she's about, well, we'll say six feet as an average. So you multiply it times five, so that's 30 something tall. Seed to bloom, they're about 100 years old. Uh, I don't think it's that long, actually. I think it's much shorter. I did, uh, we were there photographing these, and there was a German, young German couple there, and the guy was one of these guys that was, oh, he had to do things flamboyant and exciting, so he picks up an old, <laughs> dried wreath of leaves which made a nice wreath effect with a hole in the middle. And he says, well, I'm going to put that over my head. Well, what these guys don't realize is there's amazing numbers of spiders and insects that like to live in that. <laughs> he puts it over his head. And he, I've got a picture of him. He's smiling and everything, and I'm watching spiders yeah. crawling down. <laughs> I didn't tell him until I was done with the photograph. That thing came off quickly. <laughs> Talanzia palaceae, palaceae from Lima, Peru growing in the rock, Deutraconia longipetala, Deutraconia longipetala again, and Deutraconia brevis pictata. You've seen a few of these from other regions. The canyons near Aguas Calientes, this is not too far from uh, Machu Picchu, and these slopes are absolutely covered with bromeliads. Millions. And if you look carefully, you'll see some red. And if you get up close, then you see them. This is what they look like. Unbelievable areas. Talanzia latifolia and peperomia, which is a succulent plant, but it's kind of rare, so I'm showing it. Talanzia latifolia again. That's a, a quite a stunning plant, a very simple way. And it gets a beautiful pinkish mauve cast to it when it gets older. It's a nice form. Yeah, Talanzia species, I don't know which one. Somebody might tell me now, since you guys know your plants, especially with flowers. There's another little Talanzia growing up high in the mountains above the, uh, um, I just drew a blank. Is this on that winding road that goes way up high? Well, there's about 40 of those yeah, in Peru. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is one that goes way up high or above the uh, plain, the Nazca Plains. There we go. We just drew a blank for a second there. And where you'll see all of these marvelous geoglyphs. But you get up on top and it is one arid region, but occasionally there's a tree. And here was this interesting Palantir. The United States. There's not a whole lot for me to really go into, but Texas and stuff. This is Venezuela. Humulus, beautiful plant. Flamingo, again, you've seen this a number of times. 
this is one of Dennis's photos, nice photo, Herida, Venezuela. I like this, nice photo. And thank you, I've taken you on a trip.